shall rise up as we pray. Almighty God, we thank you for the Bible study tonight. Thank you because you are taking us chapter after chapter and verse after verse to know your mind. I will pray as you reveal more of your mind and purpose to us today. The revelation will do good in every life in Jesus' name. We pray you grant us the grace and the strength as well as the decision and determination to be obedient to everything you are teaching us in Jesus' name. Prepare us for heaven. Prepare us for the coming of the Lord and help us too to touch the lives of other people and prepare them for the coming of the Lord. Open the pages of scriptures to everyone. Help us to follow through every time. In Jesus' name we pray. We're coming back to First John chapter 2. We've already studied First John chapter 1. And we've gone from verses 1 to 10. Today we're looking at chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. As you open your Bible, I'm reading to you, my little children. These things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Those are the two verses we're looking at today. As we look at verse 1, it talks about the purpose why Christ came. The purpose why he sacrificed on the cross of Calvary, the purpose why the Lamb died. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And as we come to the Lord one by one, he tells us the purpose why the gospel was preached, why we repented, and why we came to the Lord. That's why it says, my little children, these things are right unto you that ye sin not. If you have come to Calvary, if you have tasted the grace of God, if you have been at the cross and you have tasted of what Jesus Christ did on the cross for you and for me and for the rest of the world, it says now you understand, you're saved, you're born again, you're a child in the ministry, child in the family, or you are a young man, or a father, or whoever you are, a member of the body of Christ, these things write out to you that you sin not. But then they say proviso. There is a fire escape. There is um, something that is done here that should in case by accident, should in case by carelessness, should in case you are taken unawares and you do sin. It's not a habitual sin, a normal sin, a, a kind of thing that goes on every day. It says, if should it so happen that you sin, if any man sin, we have an advocate of the Father. That means don't be so discouraged and feel there's no hope anymore. The hope of restoration is Jesus Christ, the righteous. And it says it's the propitiation for our sins, those of us that knew the Lord before. If you are surprised and carelessly you go back into evil, it says very quickly, immediately come back to the Lord. There is hope because Jesus is the propitiation. That's what means is the atonement, is the covering, is the one that pays the price of our redemption for our sins. And it says it's not for ours only. That those who are still to be saved, that those who are sick to come to the Lord, and when they do come, the Lord will save them. The word of God says we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. This epistle enlightens the believer concerning our privileges in the Lord Jesus Christ. A privilege of salvation, a privilege of redemption, a privilege of forgiveness, a privilege of freedom from sin, a, pri a privilege of reunion with the Lord and total renovation, renewal, and total righteousness in the presence of the Lord. The more we learn and the more we know about the Lord Jesus Christ, about his name, about his sacrifice, about his offices, the more we know about what he has done for us, the more peace we have, the more purity we have, the more rest and righteousness we shall experience and enjoy. 
Here Christ is revealed as the advocate with the Father. What does that mean? Who is an advocate? The advocate is one who pleads the cause of another. Especially in a court of civil law. He's an able defender, a righteous defender. He is an upright defender, he's a qualified defender. He's a recognized defender to plead the cause of another before any tribunal and before a judicial court. Actually, that word advocate came from uh, the Romans. Uh, what happened is that uh, the Jewish people did not understand the law of the Roman people. They didn't understand also the language of the Roman people. And the Romans were ruling over the children of Israel, the Jews. If they got into any trouble, they will employ somebody who will stand for them in the court. And that person will be a Roman. A person that knows the language of the Romans and knows the law of the Romans and he called him an advocate. And that's what uh, John the beloved is using here. He says, when you get to any trouble and you come before the judgment seat of God still here on earth, not uh, on the other side, if you come to be guilty and then you are condemned because of what you have done, he says, we have an advocate. He understands the laws of heaven. He understands the language of heaven. He understands the mind of God. He understands the full ramification of the promises of God. And because he's our advocate, he can stand before us. He can stand before the heavenly father on our behalf. That's why he says we have a defender. We have an advocate. We have the righteous one who is able to stand before the father on our behalf, as our advocate, Jesus Christ the righteous, is entered into the heaven itself. And look at uh, Hebrews, I'm reading from chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, and we're looking at verse 24. And you'll see what Jesus Christ has done. Our advocate, our defender, and the propitiation for our sins. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 9. Reading from verse 24, it says, For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are, a, are the figures of the true, but he has entered into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God. Tell me the last two words there. For us. He's appeared for us. What's he doing there? He's making intercession for us. What's he doing there? He's pleading our case. What's he doing there? He's defending us. What's he doing there? He's pointing to Calvary. He's pointing to his blood. He's saying, I died for him. I shed my blood for him. And I did that so that he can be saved. And so that he will remain saved. And so he pleads for us. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 9 and in verse 12. In chapter 9 verse 12 it says, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption again, it says, for us. For us who are believers, he has obtained eternal redemption for us. And so that's why the apostle is telling us here, my little children, he says, these things I'm writing unto you, so that you will know what Christ has done. You'll know what Christ is doing. You'll know what Christ will yet do. You will know what he did on the cross and what he's doing at the throne of God right now, pleading for you and pleading for all those who are saved, all those who have come into the kingdom of God. You see, when he says little children, these were people that just got born again. They were babes in Christ and they may not know their rights. They may not know the privileges they have. They may not know what Christ has done for them or what Christ is doing for them. That's why he's saying little children understand this. You are born again by the blood of the Lamb. You are born again by the mercy of the Lord. You are born again because of the riches of his grace. You are born again because of what Christ has done. Christ the righteous. Now you are brought into the kingdom of God. Here is the reason here is the purpose, here is the goal Why you are brought into the kingdom of God My little children These things I am writing unto you So that you will not sin What if you sin? What if you by carelessness or by temptation that's stronger than you at that moment? What if you sin? If any man sin We have an advocate Not that we add, we still have 
is pleading for us now that we cannot see Jesus Christ face to face in the natural, in the physical, doesn't mean that it's gone out of business. It's still pleading for us. It says we have Jesus Christ, the righteous. He's with the Father and he's our advocate. And it says he is, even at the present time, not just in the past when he died on the cross, he is at this present time, not in the future. When we'll see him face to face, he is at this present time. Any Anytime you have difficulty, anytime you have challenges, anytime you have temptation, anytime you feel weak, anytime maybe you have tripped into what you shouldn't have done, remember he is the propitiation for our sins. And then he says, not for hours only, he is the uh, propitiation for the sin of the whole world. Jesus Christ then is Savior. Jesus Christ is Lord and Master. Jesus Christ is the propitiation for our sins. Uh, the covering is the atonement for our sin. Is the high priest. And then is our advocate, is the bishop and the shepherd of our souls. What a savior he is. As we look at these two verses, we have uh, put the title, the high, the priesthood of Christ, our righteous advocate. The priesthood of Christ, our righteous Advocate, you know what the priest did in the Old Testament for those children of Israel will stand before God on their behalf and will stand before them on behalf of God. He'll teach them the word of God, the requirements of God, and then he'll go to God praying for them, interceding for them as the priest or the high priest of the people on behalf of God. And that's exactly what Christ is doing for us today. He intercedes for us. He prays for us. And because of that, that's why he is our high priest and he is our advocate. In Hebrews, I'm um, looking at chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3, we look at the title of Jesus, we look at the responsibility of Jesus, and we look at what Jesus is doing right now uh, before the throne of the Heavenly Father. It tells us in chapter 3 of Hebrews, and I'm reading from verse 1, it says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and the high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. He is the high priest of our profession. We have come to the Lord because he died for us. We have come to the Lord because we believe that he paid the whole price for us. We have come to the Lord and we know that as we stand with him and as we stand in him and as we look at what he has done for us, we can stand in righteousness and we can stand in holiness. We can stand in purity because the blood of Jesus Christ, his only begotten son, cleanses us from all sin. And this uh, is uh, the emphasis of the apostles in a first John, come back to first John. You'll see that in chapter one, it talks about sin and it talks about how we can receive forgiveness from all the sins we have committed. Look at verse nine. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It talks about our salvation. It talks about our sanctification. It talks about the removal of the external sin, outward sin, and talks about the removal of the inward sin. And then it tells us in verse 7 of that chapter 1, it says, But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. And so you understand the emphasis of the apostles. Says the purpose, I'm writing this to you is for you to know the victory you can have and the victory you already have in the Lord Jesus Christ that she is seen not. Look at chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 5. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins and in him is no sin. That Christ Jesus was manifested. Christ Jesus was revealed and Christ Jesus Jesus died for us so as to take away our sins. And it says in him is no sin. Look at verse 6. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. He does not keep on practicing sin, living in sin, habitually sinning. No, he doesn't do that if he's born again. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth has not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that 
doeth righteousness is righteous. He that continually lives in righteousness is not sinning. Little children, I'm writing this to you so that you will know the privilege you have, the victory you have, the righteousness you have, that you can keep on living in righteousness. He says, even as he is righteous, in verse 8, he that committed sin is of the devil. He that says, well, the provision is there. If I sin, I can always go back to Calvary. I can always uh, ask for forgiveness. And it makes that a habit. It's habitually sinning, continually sinning. It's consistently sinning, and he delights in that sinning. He said he, is, he doesn't even know the Lord is of the devil. For the devil sinned from the beginning for this purpose, for this reason. The Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Verse 9, whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. You see, a person who is born of God does not have the desire to rebel against God, desire to be disobedient to God, or desire to be living in all the vomit that uh, he had already rejected because he's a child of God now, because he's born again now, because the grace of God is in his life now, and because the blood of Jesus Christ avails for him. That's why that new birth shields him from sin. That new birth protects him from sin. That new birth makes him victorious over sin. Verse 9, whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Look at verse 10. In this, the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil whosoever, whosoever whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother look at chapter 5 in chapter 5 it tells us once again that if you're a real child of God you don't make sin a practice rebellion a practice, disobedience a practice, blasphemy a practice, transgression a practice you are not in that line anymore. It tells us in chapter 5 verse 18. It says we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. Now you couldn't misunderstand the language of uh, John the Beloved. It was very clear and categorical. It was very clear and very plain. It said this we know. If you have any experience in the Lord, this we know. If you have any revelation coming from heaven, this we know. If you have tasted of the grace of God, this we know. If the Spirit of God is teaching you of what a Christian life consists of, it says, this we know. That whosoever, whosoever, whosoever is born of God, sinneth not. But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself. And that wicked one toucheth him not. I pray that uh, this uh, study will move you to the victory side in Jesus' name. I said it will move you to the victory side in Jesus' name. You will know your right. You'll know your privilege. You'll know your responsibility. And you know the very fact that if you're a child of God, sin is something of the past. It should not be in your present life. We're going to divide the passage to three parts. Number one, the glorious purpose of revelation for believers. The glorious purpose of revelation for believers. You're a child of God. You've come to know the Lord as your personal savior. And you know you're a believer. What a glorious purpose we have of the revelation of the word of God. Number two is the gracious provision of restoration for backsliders. The gracious provision of restoration for backsliders. If you backslide, don't remain in that backsliding condition. Come back to the Lord. There is a gracious provision of restoration for backsliders. Number three is a great propitiation. And redemption without bounds. That means without limits. That means it extends to everyone in the world. Everyone in the church and everyone outside the church. The great propitiation and redemption without bounds. Meaning without limits. So let's come back to uh, number one. The glorious purpose of revelation for believers. Glorious purpose of revelation for believers. I'm reading the first part of chapter 2 verse 1. My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. That's the glorious purpose of revealing the mind of God, the word of God, the scriptures 
teaching us the epistles, teaching us all these Bible studies. This is a glorious purpose of that revelation for you as a believer and for me as a believer, for us as believers. My little children, this is right down to you that you sin not. First of all, let's look at that language. My little children, as uh, John the beloved looked at the whole church, he actually divided the church into three parts. One, two, three. Number one, the little children. Number two, the young men. Number three, the fathers. Number one, the little children, the babes in Christ. Those who have just gotten converted. And those who just came into the kingdom of God. The new citizens of the kingdom. My little children. But number two, the people who have come into the Lord for some time and they have been in Christ for some time. They have been in the gospel for some time and they know the word of God more than those little children. He calls them the young men. Number three, the father the adult and the mature ones, the ones who have been with the Lord for a long, long time. And because of that, they have much, much experience and they don't uh, they are no more in the rudimentary class of the Christian faith. Look at it from verse 12 of 1 John chapter 2, verse 12. It says, I write unto you little children because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. So you understand? When he talks about little children, he's talking about those who have experienced forgiveness. They have experienced the new birth. They have experienced salvation. And they know that they belong to the kingdom of God. Yes, they are new. Yes, they are new converts. Yes, they are babes in Christ. But they have the life of Christ in them. Because they have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And their sins have been forgiven unto them. Look at the next verse there, verse 13. I write unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. It's writing to those adult, mature believers developing and growing believers do so like fathers in the fold and it says I'm writing to you because already you know him that was from the beginning and then he tells us the latter part of that verse 13 it says I write unto you a young man because he have overcome the wicked one these were the people that have faced the battles of life the temptations of life the trials of life and they have overcome and they have lived victorious and he says, I'm still writing unto you all the same. But certain latter part, I write unto you, little children, because ye have known the Father. These were the people that can say, Abba, Father. They knew the Father. And because they knew the Father, they knew that whatever they ask of him in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, he will give unto them. He continues in verse 14, I have written unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. He's still emphasizing the fact that these are not newcomers. These are not newcomers. These were the people that have known God from the beginning. Then he says, I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong. And the word of God abideth in you. And ye have overcome the wicked one. And so, when he says, I'm writing to you, little children, that ye sin not. Think about that. If the new converts are not to sin. If the new converts are not to make it a practice of sinning. And then going back every Sunday, God forgive me. If the new converts and the new babes and the uh, little children are not to make it a practice of stealing and repenting. Committing adultery and repenting. Committing fornication and repenting every week and every month and every year how about the young men, those who are older how about the, how about the fathers those who are matured in Christ it's writing there to everybody if the youngest of us are not to be living in sin, then those who have matured in Christ and those who are young men and young women in Christ must not be living in sin, I write unto you that she sin not, you see many people do not understand that this is the purpose of the whole scripture Sure. That is, as we go from Genesis to Revelation, the reason why we're given the whole Bible is that she sinned not. You start from the time of Abimelech. When God told Abimelech, you shouldn't have taken Abraham's wife. And he said, I'm innocent. I didn't even know that it was the man's wife. He said, that's why I kept you from sinning against me. The purpose is that you sin not. And you come 
unto Abraham, walk before me and be thou perfect. The purpose of relationship between Abraham and God is that you see not, and you come to Moses, and then he brings all these sacrifices. If any of you sees, this is what you do. And what's the reason for that? That you see not, you come to the Psalms, and the Psalms are teaching us and instructing us that you have to live the righteous life. If you're going to see the face of God in glory, the purpose of the Psalms that you see not, you come to the prophets, and what are the prophets telling us? The same thing. I'm writing to you, I'm teaching you, I'm instructing you that you see not. And then you come to the New Testament. Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. It separates us from sin. It separates sin away from us. The purpose of the whole Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, and the Gospels and the Epistles is that you see not. Look at what the Word of God is saying. And then look at Psalm 4. I'm reading from verses 3 and 4. Psalm 4. We're looking at verses 3 and 4. And you'll see the goal, the purpose, the reason why we're given the Bible and the purpose why we come to know the Lord. It's not so that we'll keep on uh, falling back into sin and playing with sin and playing with danger, but that we come out of sin, come clean away from sin, and we're separated totally and forever from sin. In Psalm 4, I'm reading from verses 3 and 4. It says, but know that the Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. Stand in awe and see not. You see that? The purpose of God in giving us the word of God. And in calling us to himself so that we have relationship with him. Is that we see not. He says stand in awe and see not. Commune with your own heart upon your bed. And be still. Then it says, think about that. It tells us in Psalm 119, Psalm 119. It's still emphasizing the same purpose that a child of God does not uh, play uh, near the rim of sin, near the brink of sin, near the pit of sin. You stay clear, you stay away because you know you belong to the Lord and because you know you have been saved by the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, you will not, uh, you know, keep on playing with sin and gambling with your soul. It tells us in chapter 119 verse 11 Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. That's the whole purpose. If you have come to the Lord, this there is you came to the Lord, that the power of the Lord, the strength of the Lord, the presence of the Lord within you will keep you away from sinning. Will keep you away from evil. It says, I'm hiding your word in mine heart that I might not sin against Come to Ezekiel chapter 3 and see the reason why God sent uh, the prophet to the children of Israel and why God says the preachers to you, to me, to us today. In Ezekiel chapter 3, reading from verse 21, it says in verse 21, Nevertheless, if thou want the righteous man, that the righteous man sin not. You see that? If the preachers warn and the righteous sin not. If the prophets warn the people and the people sin not. That, that's the purpose of God. That's the joy of the Lord. And that's the joy of Calvary. All that Jesus did on the cross. That's his joy. That his blood has cleansed us. His blood has converted us. His blood has changed us. His blood has transformed us. And we hate sin. And then we're hearing the word of God, the teaching of the word of God. And that teaching of the word of God is influencing us and inspiring us to stand against sin. It says to Ezekiel, nevertheless, if thou want the righteous man, that the righteous sin not, and he does not sin. And he does not sin. It doesn't take, uh, the, you know, the righteous man does not take the study for a Jew or the preaching for a joke or the messages for a joke it says that's the watch of the Lord is coming from God and coming through the prophet or the preacher and I will not see it says he shall surely live because he is warned also thou hast delivered thy soul welcome to John we're coming to the New Testament now the Lord healed quite a lot of people in some cities he healed them all in some communities he healed them all but 
then when he healed them, he told them the reason why he healed them. The reason is that the healing is not just, okay, you are healed, go and live the way you want to live. You are healed, go and enjoy life. You are healed, I'm giving you health and strength to go and serve the devil. Never. It doesn't heal us to, so that we can have more strength to serve the devil, so that we can have more strength to commit sin. He heals us so that he will put our feet in the path of righteousness. John chapter 5. In John chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 14. It says, after what Jesus findeth him in the temple, and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole, sin no more. Lest a worse sin come unto thee. You see that he forgives, we thank God, and he heals, we thank God. But then he tells us, you have been healed. You have been made whole. I did that for you, not to give you strength to go and serve the devil, to go and continue to commit sin. I did that for you to show mercy unto you that you will sin not, sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. It will be very clear to you if you are very sincere. It will be very clear to you if you are a real child of God. It will be very clear to you if you are not covering up your sin, if you are not a candidate of hellfire. It will be very clear to you that the purpose of God, the intention of God. Why he saved you is so that you will not continue in sin. I'm looking at John chapter 8. In John chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 11. This is a woman that had been taken in the very act of immorality. And yet, uh, the Lord was willing to forgive because he forgives. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But would you know, forgiveness does not mean license to continue in sin. Forgiveness does not mean you know God is so merciful and God is so gracious. I can always come back and you know tell him I've done it again. Please forgive me. That's not the purpose of forgiveness. The purpose of forgiveness is for you to be so grateful to God that Christ died for you and your sin cost him his death, a painful death and a good night sin death. And now you come to the Lord and say Lord I will not do that again. Look at John chapter 8 and in verse 11 she said no man lord and, uh, the, and Jesus said unto her neither do I condemn you that means I forgive your past I forgive everything you have confessed and forsaken it says neither do I condemn you but go and sin no more you see the purpose of the gospels you see the purpose of Christ is so that you will not sin he doesn't want us to continue in sin we will not continue in sin I'm talking to you there. I said, we're not continuing sin. Little children, little converse, young converse, these things write down to you that you sin not. We're looking at Romans chapter 6. And we're reading from verse 6 and verse 7. Romans chapter 6. We're looking at verse 6. Knowing this, that an old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. You see that the very root of sin might be destroyed. The very nucleus of sin might be destroyed. The very originator of sin within us uh, before we are born again can be destroyed. It says, now you ought to know this one. Our old man is crucified with him. That the body of sin might be destroyed and that henceforth you should not serve sin. Henceforth, you are a child of God. This is the evidence you are born again. If this evidence is not there, there's no new birth. If you still desire to go back to your vomit, there's no new birth. If you still desire to continue stealing and lying and deceiving, there's no new birth. There's no salvation there. The salvation is revealed because the wanting to, that's taken away. The desire to, that's taken away. The practice of that evil thing, that's taken away. And then the body of sin is destroyed. Destroy that henceforth you will not serve sin in verse 7. He for he that is dead is freed from sin. You're not tied to the sin, you're not glued to the sin, and you're not bound to the sin. There is a deliverance. Look at verse 11. In verse 11, likewise, reckon ye also yourself to be dead indeed unto sin, and but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. 
sin will knock at the door. Temptation will knock at the door. Evil will knock at the door. Wickedness will knock at the door. Immorality will knock at the door. Temptation might come. You will not permit it. You have somebody on the inside of you. His name is Jesus, Lord and Savior. And he's mighty and powerful. He says, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone opens the door, I will come in unto him. He lives in there and he's the mighty one and he's strong. And when temptation knocks at the door, say no to that temptation. You say, that was in the past. I could do that in the past, but no more. You now reckon yourself dead indeed unto sin. And then it says that you will not allow sin to reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the laws thereof. There is a change, and that change will be permanent and visible in your life in Jesus' name. Look at First Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians chapter 15, and I'm reading from verse 34. And you'll see what the Lord is emphasizing over and over from the Old Testament to the New Testament. That if you're a child of God, little children, I'm writing this to you, I'm preaching this to you, I'm instructing you this way that ye sin not. It tells us in First Corinthians chapter 15 verse 34 it says awake to righteousness and sin not very clear very categorical and there's no maybe or but there's no allowance here for sinning it says awake to righteousness and sin not what does that mean it means awake to righteousness and lie not Awake to righteousness and deceive not. Awake to righteousness and rebel not. Awake to righteousness and transgress not. Any form of sin, any shape of sin. It says you are born again, you are a child of God. Come on now, awake and understand who you are in Christ. Awake to righteousness and sin not. Then it says, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. He told the Corinthian believers, he said, you speak in tongues, I have this gift, I have that gift. And that's what they were rejoicing. And he says, some of you are so ignorant, you do not have the knowledge of God. He says, Corinthians, I'm ashamed of you. You say you're a believer and you're still living in sin. Awake, awake to righteousness and sin not. I pray the power to overcome sin every time the Lord will give it to every one of us. You have it already exercised. You are going to be free. I said you are going to be free. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1. Hebrews chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 1. Here is what the Lord is telling us. It says, Wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight. And the sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. It says looking unto Jesus. The author and the finisher of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Despising the shame. And is set down on the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. Lest ye be, uh, lest ye be wearied and faint in your hearts. Look at this. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. You know what it says there? When sin is coming, when temptation is coming, because you know the danger. You know that if you fall into that sin, if you give in to that sin, should you die before you are restored, it will be held fire forever. That's why it says you will resist what your very life even if you have to die resisting sin, you will do that. He said, you have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. And that's why the word of God tells us that we need to come out of whatever it is, whatever it is that binds you to that sin, to that weakness, to that evil, you come out so that you will not perish. And the grace of God will help you. The strength of the Lord will hold you up. And this word of God will jerk you out of that sin and you'll come on the righteous side in Jesus' name. Look at Revelation chapter 18. Revelation chapter 18 and I'm reading from verse 4. It says, Revelation chapter 18 verse 4, it says, And I had another voice from heaven saying, Come out from among my people, that she be not partakers of 
her sins. In your community, you'll find a lot of sinners. In your community, you'll find people, they gamble with their lives, they gamble with their souls. Even those who say they go to church, they say they go to gospel churches, they do not understand that uh, going to church is not enough. Uh, professing to be born again is not enough. You must come out of sin and you must live a righteous life. If you're going to see the face of God in heaven, your life must be pure and clean and righteous. That's why it says you're living among them, then your community, then your street. Maybe you go to the same school and they play with sin and they joke with sin and they feel there's nothing. I'll go back to church on Sunday and I'll tell our pastor and then they will tell me what to do and then I'll make my way clear. It says, Come out from among them that she be not partakers of their sins that she received not of her plagues for her sins have reached unto heaven and God has remembered her iniquities come back to uh, first john chapter 2 first john chapter 2 you have now known you have now seen you have not learned you have heard what is the purpose of the scriptures the purpose of God, the purpose of Christ, and the purpose of the Holy Spirit giving us these opportunities to learn from the Word of God. Here, here is the purpose, my little children. These things write I unto you that ye sin not. That ye sin not. Are you saved? Are you saved? That ye sin not. Are you sanctified? Why are you sanctified? That ye sin not. Are you filled of the Holy Ghost? Why? That you see not. Are you coming to the Bible study? That you see not. Are you reading your Bible every day? I have quiet time. I have morning devotion and evening devotion. Why? That you see not. Why are you reading what has been written? Why are you learning from what we're reading here in the scriptures? The whole purpose is that you see not. Why are you evangelizing? Why are you telling other people the way of the Lord? You are telling them that you will not sin and they will not sin so that they will get to heaven. And the whole purpose purpose of what we're doing, why we come to the Lord, and why we remain with the Lord, my little children, these things are right unto you, and this is a minister unto you, that you sin not. But here now, in the second part, there's a problem. I come to point number two, the gracious provision of restoration for backsliders. Backsliders. Now you understand, a believer is different from a backslider. A backslider is different from a believer. And you cannot be a believer and a backslider at the same time. You cannot be a man and a woman at the same time. You cannot be inside the ocean and out of the sea at the same time. You cannot be inside the kingdom and outside the kingdom at the same time. You cannot serve two masters. You cannot be under the rulership and the kingdom and the lordship of Jesus Christ the Savior and then under the rulership and the kingship and the lordship of Satan at the same time. You are either a believer or an unbeliever or a backslider. But what if you backslide? What's the provision that the Lord has made? That's why it says in this second part of chapter 2 verse 1, it says, And if any man sin, we have an advocate for the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. As I told you before, this is a fire escape provision in an emergency. A fire escape provision emergency is not, uh, you know, something you use every day. It's like when you have a door and you have many doors in the house. Normally you go throughout this door and then there's a particular door. They say this is for fire escape. You get into, you know, some apartments and it says, should in case there's any alarm that, that goes off and then you hear there is fire, don't use the lead. This is where you're going to use is fire escape. It's provided there so that should an accident occur, should something unexpected happen, you'll know the door to quickly go through. This is not to encourage daily, frequent, habitual sinning. This is not to encourage a person to deliberately and habitually sin, uh, which leads to hardness of heart. If you're sinning every time, you do it now, I'll repent later. It will hard in your heart and you go from the hardening of the heart to eventually you, are, you have become a 
perpetual backslider. You become an apostate, and then you'll be damned, and you will suffer in hell fire forever. The person who changes the word of God, and he doesn't know that this is not talking about, you know, keep on sinning, and then everything will be all right. Keep on sinning and repenting. Everything will be okay. Keep on sinning. Keep on committing adultery, and everything will be all right. And keep on committing fornication. Everything you can always come back and keep on stealing. Everything will be all right. And keep on lying. Everything will be all right. And keep on blaspheming. Everything will be all right. And keep on uh, rebelling against God. Everything will be all right. No, that, that's not. It says Eve. This one is accident. This one is not something you planned for. This one is not something you are doing continually and regularly and habitually in your life. It says if any man sin, if any man lie, not every time. But it just came surprisingly. Do something about that. If any man commit immorality, not something you are doing, you know, every time, and you are doing this and that. In fact, in your life, it should never be spoken of at all. If it so happens accidentally that you just couldn't discover yourself, and then it happens, it says, run back to Calvary immediately, run back to the cross immediately, and run back for cleansing, washing, and purifying in the blood of the Lamb immediately, because if any man see, we have an advocate for well, the Father, is Jesus Christ, the righteous. I want you to look at this provision as we made every time. If you come back to the Old Testament, as soon as we do, we we'll look at the Old, and we we'll look at the New. You're looking at Levi Leviticus chapter 4. Leviticus chapter 4. I'm reading from verses 2 and 3. Leviticus chapter 4. And we're looking at verses 2 and 3. It says, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a soul shall sin. You see that if. It's not when. It's not this is a regular thing. It's not this is a weekly thing. It's not this the habitual thing. It's not this the deliberate thing you always do. There's no provision for that. That's presumptuous sin. If you deliberately, you are committing sin, committing sin, God is merciful and God is kind and God is love, you might go to hell, you might get to hell before you even dreamt about it. But this is accidental. That's why it says, if a soul shall sin through ignorance against any of the commandment of the Lord concerning things which ought not to be done and shall do against any of them if the priest that is anointed do sin you remember that if it's always there it's not when it's not you know i can always do this and you know i don't have any power this is my weakness lying is my weakness fornication is my peculiarity adultery is my weakness no Let's not talk about that. Uh, those ones are candidates for hell. Those are firewood for hell. But this is accidental. If the, if the priest that is anointed do sin according to the sin of the people, it says, then let him bring for his sin, which he has sinned a young bullock without blemish unto the Lord for a sin offering. He will not say, well, since that happened, it, 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 it doesn't happen every time and it just happened now surprisingly accidentally okay god understands no you still bring an offering the sin offering he'll make atonement for that accidental sin and that's what the lord is saying look at verse 13 that same chapter look at verse 13 in verse 13 it says and if the whole congregation of israel sin if if the congregation is not sinning every time, the congregation is not, you know, that, that, that's the way we are, we'll always do that. And, you know, God will have to accept our congregation just like that. This is a peculiar congregation. This is a peculiar situation. No, God doesn't accept that. He says, if it's an individual that sins accidentally, if it's a priest or the prophet or the preacher that sins accidentally, if it's a whole congregation, you know, sometimes uh, there are some congregations uh, out there, and uh, you know, once you come in, everybody knows that congregation. They, they are good in this, they are good in this, they are good in that, but there's a peculiar thing they do. And once a new convert comes in there, you know, that thing will splash on them. It's like, uh, you know, if it's adultery that is uh, peculiar to that congregation, they don't repent. They don't turn away. They just keep on committing that adultery. They say, well, God knows we're good in every other thing. Only this peculiarity. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, there are some people now, they say they have youth, uh, youth church. 
And that's your church. They are all there. The adults are, you know, on their own. And then you just go there. Their kind of music and their kind of lifestyle. And that youth church, there is a peculiarity there. Fornication is the order of the day. And people say, you know, that good, that youth church is so wonderful. It's beautiful. It's glorious. Only one but. Only one situation, uh, you know, fornication is rampant there. And, and the leaders know, and they leave them like that. Because they say, you know, these are young people. I want them to be free. They are free to go to hell. They are free to perish. But you see, if a congregation sin, look at verse 13. If the whole congregation of Israel sin through ignorance, and the sin be hid from the eyes of the assembly, and they have done somewhat against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning the things which should not be done and are guilty when the sin which they have sinned against it is known. The congregation shall offer a young bullock for the sin and bring him before the tabernacle of the congregation. It's talking about the propitiation for their sin. It's talking about the atonement for their sin. It's talking about the blood that should be shed, even for that sin, even when it's the whole congregation that does something like that. Look at verse 27. In verse 27, here's what it says, and if any one of the common people sin through ignorance, any one of of the common people see through ignorance. You know, there are sometimes that somebody says, I'm born again. I'm a child of God. And then he goes to something that he shouldn't, shouldn't have done. I would say, come on here. This is wrong. This is not right. Oh, he says, pastor, hold on. I'm not, you know, I don't know Bible. I don't know English. I only know our vernacular Bible. And therefore, I may do things. I, this one you are talking about, I may still do it again. That's a child of hell. But you know, it says, any one of the common people, if he does something, sinning against the Lord, read it yourself, verse 27. And if any one of the common people sin through ignorance, while he doeth somewhat against any of the commandment of the Lord, it says, concerning the things which not ought not to be done, and be guilty, or if a sin which he has seen come to his knowledge, then he shall bring his Offering a, a kind, a, a kid of the goats, or a, and if a female without blemish for a sin which he has sinned. Uh, you will see then that, uh, you know, the Lord is not talking about the people that deliberately go into sin. You know that adultery is wrong, and they say, well, I just, you know, I just want to do it. You know, fornication is wrong. They say, even because they are talking about it, because they are hammering it, and they say, fornication fornication, fornication, let them do what they will do. I'm even going to do it because they are mentioning it. When they stop mentioning it, then I will stop. But because they emphasize it all the time, deliberately, I'm going to do it to show them that I don't accept what they are saying. You are showing us that you want to go to hell, you want to perish. Look at the Bible. Hebrews chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 26 for the people who deliberately go into evil. Uh, some people say, I'm going to punish my husband. That, that man is not, uh, you know, doing well. He's not, uh, he, he doesn't understand how to, you know, pet your wife and talk to your wife and all. I will punish him. And I'm go I know he doesn't like this. I know nobody likes it. No husband likes it. I'm going to do it to make him angry and to make him suffer. You will go to hell. There are some husbands that will say, I'm going to punish that woman. I demanded for this and she didn't allow me to do what I ought to do. And I'm going to punish her. I'm going to do this. You will go to hell because that's presumptuous sin. That's not, you know, if any man sin by accident or by surprise, that one is deliberate. Look at Hebrews chapter 10. I'm reading here from verse 26. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there, is, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. If we sin willfully, 
You know, they, they said that, you know, somebody stole uh, money and then they disciplined the person. Ah, okay, that's what you're going to do. Because of that discipline you laid on that person, I'm going to show you that I will do it deliberately. I didn't even think I was going to do this before. But because of what the church is saying, because of the direction the church is going, I am going to do it and do whatever you want. You will not be forgiven. That's presumptuous sin. You want to go to her, you open your eyes and you say, because they said this, because they said that, I am going to sin. You will lose your soul. You will go to hell. Look at that verse 26 again. It says, and if we sin willfully, after we have, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sin. But a certain fear for looking for of judgment and fairy indignation which shall consume the adversary. He that despiseth Moses' uh, law died without mercy under two or three witnesses of, of how much sorrow punishment suppose he shall he be thought worthy who have trodden under the, the underfoot the Son of God and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and has done despite unto the spirit of grace. For we know him that has said vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense says the Lord and again the Lord shall judge his people. Verse 31 it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And so you understand uh, we're not talking about those who deliberately go to commit sin and they say I don't care what they say. I don't care what they preach. I don't care what they're teaching. This is what I'm going to do. We're not talking about those people, but those people that are surprised, you know, with their careless and accidentally something happened, and then they go to sin, and then they rush back into the, uh, to Calvary. They rush back to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm sorry. It pains them in their hearts. They're sorrowful in their hearts, and they repent in bitter tears. Those are the people that the Lord will forgive, but the people that just deliberately go on in that rebellious but leading position, there's no provision for them. James chapter 5. When you come back like that, you need to understand you are coming back as a backslider. You are coming back as a sinner. In James chapter 5 verse 19, brethren, if any of you, can you see every time he's talking about sin, he's talking about if. It's not talking about when, you know, this is a natural thing. Everybody will do it once in a while. And when you do it, no problem, no, no big deal. Just go back to Calvary. Not at all. This is it. This is accidental. If any of you hear from the truth and one convert him, he was a believer, he heard from the truth, he backslid, he now needs conversion. He needs conversion. He needs restoration. He needs salvation. He needs a cleansing again, forgiveness again. Verse 19, brethren, if any of you do hear from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converts the sinner. He was a believer. But now he's a sinner. He which converted the sinner from the error of his way shall save his soul from death. If he didn't, if he didn't repent, he will die in that sin. And he will go to a lost eternity. He'll go to hell. But because, you know, he knew he must lead, he is returned to the Lord. He says he'll, he now, he'll save his soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. The Lord is calling us to righteousness. He's saying we should not sin. In fact, it says in Titus chapter 2, Titus chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 11. It tells us in chapter, Titus chapter 2 verse 11, For the grace of God has appeared, uh, that, that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness. That's what the gospel teaches us. Deny ungodliness and worldly laws shall live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world. That's what the gospel teaches us. That's what the Lord teaches us. And that's what all the preaching we're hearing, messages we're hearing, that's what they teach us. Teaching us that deny no godliness and worldly laws. We should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. Looking for, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the, of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that he might Tell me, tell me out loud, 
redeem us from all iniquity. That's the purpose to redeem us, to save us, to take us out, to rescue us out of all iniquity and to purify unto Himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. That, that's the reason He saved us, and that's the reason we are coming to the Bible study so that you'll be strong in your Christian faith and strong in your Christian conviction. And you will know a Christian is not supposed to be falling and rising, falling and rising, falling and rising. Little children or young people or fathers, this, uh, this thing I write unto you that ye sin not. And if you have seen before this time, today settle with God, and after you settle with God today, you will not go back to that sin again in Jesus name. We come to point number three now. The great propitiation. The great propitiation and redemption without bounds. Without bounds that means this redemption is for everyone and this provision is for everyone. Salvation available for everyone and cleansing available for everyone. Forgiveness available for everyone. Freedom from sin available for everyone. A ticket to heaven available for everyone one, the experience of knowing the total redemption of the Lord and knowing the sanctification of the Lord, the sanctifying power and the purifying power available for everyone so that you'll, you'll not say, well, this is, uh, maybe it's not for me. I'm not supposed to be saved and victorious. I'm not supposed to be saved and righteous. It's for everyone. Look at it now in chapter 2 verse 2. First John chapter 2 verse 2. And he is a propitiation for our sins. He's talking about the believers there now. Now, those who are falling to sin, come back again and go to Calvary and understand that he, Christ, is the propitiation for sins. Then he says, not for ours only, not for those in the church only, but even for those in the world, not for ours only, but also for the sin of the whole world. There should be no doubt in your mind that Jesus Christ died for everyone. Jesus Christ gave his life for everyone. Look at First John chapter 4 verse 10. First John chapter Chapter 4 and verse 10. It says here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins, to be the atonement for our sins, to be the sacrifice for our sins, to be the covering and the cleansing for our sins. Look at verse 14. And we have seen and do testify that the father sent the son to be the savior of the world, the savior of every sinner in the world. That's why it says, whosoever shall call on the name of of the Lord shall be saved. If you come, he will not reject you. Whosoever comes to me, I will in no wise cast away. That's why you can come. And as you come, the Lord will forgive, he will cleanse, he will save. And if you are already saved, he will make you steadfast and true and faithful in Jesus' name. In uh, Romans chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 23. Romans chapter 3, we're looking at it from verse 23. In verse 23, it says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But what's the provision that has made for everyone in verse 24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation. You see that is a sacrifice. You see that is the atonement. You see that is the blood that is shed that makes us acceptable in the sight of the Lord. Propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission, removal forgiveness of the sins that are past. Listen to that. Of the sins that are past. Of the sins that are past. Why am I emphasizing that there are some erroneous teachers and false uh, preachers they will say, God has forgiven us. He has forgiven us the past, the present and the future. That means you have a license because, you know, whatever sin you commit in the future, everything is taken care of. Those are the people that want to habitually keep on sinning. And they want to excuse their sin. And they want to make rubbish Calvary. And rubbish the atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you say, all our sins are forgiven. The sins of the past and of the present and of the future. It doesn't say that. It says, it's to, be, it's to give us remission of the sins that are past. Through the redemption of God. To declare, verse 26, I say, at this time, is righteousness that by that... Uh, 
that ye might be just and justifier of him which believeth on the Lord Jesus Christ. As you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you understand that it becomes a propitiation for your sin. Anywhere you are in the world, whoever you are in the world. John chapter 1 verse 29. John chapter 1 verse 29. The next day, John sees Jesus coming unto him and says, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away, tell me, the sin of the world. The sin of the world. The whole world. He made that sacrifice for the whole world. Chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 16. Chapter 3 verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever, whosoever, no matter where he's living, any part of the world. You know there are people that say, well, if you are predestinated for salvation. If you are ordained for salvation. If God has marked you now for eternity, you'll be saved. There's nothing like that. He loves everybody and Jesus Christ shed his blood for everyone. That's why it says uh, that uh, for God so loved the whole world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Verse 17, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. The world, the world, everyone in the world. In verse 20, verse 18, now you declare yourself if you're a believer. If you believe in that blood that is shed, that's how the salvation will be yours. Verse 18, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. The one that uh, separates himself, the one that says, no, I don't want the blood of Jesus to cleanse me, to provide forgiveness for me. I want to go to heaven by myself and I'm going to try the best I can. No, you cannot try the best you can. Your best will be like filthy rags and you will not be able to get there. And so if you reject this only way, this one way that leads to heaven, you'll be forever lost because it says, he that believeth not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. Look at chapter 4 verse 42. Is the savior of the whole world. Savior of the whole world. It's not the savior of just a section of the world. It's sacrifice for every, everyone. That's why it says in chapter 4 of John verse 42 and said unto the woman now we believe not because of thy sin for we have heard him ourselves and know that this is indeed the Christ the savior of of the world. Indeed, this is the Christ, the Savior of the world. Second Corinthians chapter 5. In Second Corinthians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 18. He's telling us that he wants to reconcile the whole world unto himself and all things of God, who was reconciled to himself by Jesus Christ. He has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation to wit, that is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Reconciling the world unto himself. Not imputing their trespasses unto them. And has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we as ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled unto God. That salvation is available for everyone. And because of the atonement, the ransom was made for everyone. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, I'm reading from verses 3 and 4. 1 Timothy chapter 2. And we're looking at verse 3. 1 Timothy chapter 2. And we're looking at it from verse 3. Here is the watch of the Lord talking about the redemption of Christ for everyone. The salvation of Christ for everyone. The atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ the death he died on the cross for everyone in first Timothy chapter 2 verse 3 for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who will have all men to be saved that's his desire that's his provision who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth he doesn't want anybody to perish and I pray you will not perish as you turn away from sin and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, salvation comes. And God is no respecter of persons. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Look at Second Peter chapter 3. 
Second Peter chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but he is long suffering towards what? Not willing that any should perish. Not willing that any should perish. You'll be reading some erroneous materials and he's saying that God has ordained and predestined and predestinated some to perish forever and ever. They don't even have a chance to repent. That's wrong. That's wrong. He says he's not willing that any should perish, but that all shall come to repentance. I pray that if you have not come to repentance, this will be your day. And you will come to repentance in Jesus' name. Because he has tasted death for you. He has paid your penalty. And you can come to the Lord. Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. I'm reading here from verse 9. It says, For we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should tell me what follows. Tell me everything in that sentence. Say it out aloud once you go. Taste dead for every man. He died for you. He died for everyone. He died for the whole world. Jesus Christ died that you might live. He gave his life that you might come to the cross and come to the Father. He wants to bring you to glory. He wants to bring you to salvation. He wants to bring you to redemption. He wants everyone to repent. The times of ignorance he winked at and now he commands all men everywhere to repent and to turn to the Lord. And if you have not turned to the Lord, this is your chance. Nobody knows when you will leave this world. Nobody knows when you will die. And nobody knows when Christ will come. If you delay another day and you are not saved, you might be lost and spend eternity in hellfire. But understand that Jesus Christ died for you. He tasted death for everyone. Then he says in verse 10, for it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory. In bringing many sons unto glory. He wants to get you to heaven to make uh, to make the captain, the captain of our salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctifies and they which are sanctified are all of one and for which cause is not ashamed to call them brethren you can come in today and become a brother a sister in Christ you can come in today and become a little child in Christ you can come in today and become a new convert in Christ you can come in today and then you come into the kingdom and then your sins are wiped away forgiveness has come redemption has come and then you'll be able to live in righteousness by the grace of God by the strength of the Lord for the rest of your life. You understand the purpose of the study today is to remind you that if you are in Christ, if you have come to the Lord, you should live a righteous life. Members, live a righteous life. Ministers, live a righteous life. Pastors and preachers, live a righteous life. Men and women, live a righteous life. My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate for the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only but also for the sins of the whole world salvation is available sanctification is available freedom is available forgiveness is available righteousness is available purity of heart is available holiness without which no man shall save the Lord is available come today he will forgive he will set you free he will cleanse you he will purify you he will purge your soul your spirit he will give you the strength and the power and the grace to go and sin no more new strength new life new ability will come into you and you'll be able to say praise the lord i've learned this so that i sin not and the grace of god will keep me and i will not sin am i talking to somebody there you will not sin in jesus name rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer and say Lord have mercy on me Lord have mercy on me I want to live a righteous life I want to live a pure life and I thank you for what you have done for me you have made the sacrifice for me and I know that you will purify me you will purge me and you will so cleanse me and give me the grace and the strength and the power that I will go and sin no more go and sin no more go and sin no more these things have reached unto you that she may not sin. These things are written unto you that she may not sin. These things are written unto you that she may not sin. If you have sinned in the past, make up your mind now by his grace, in his strength, through his salvation, you'll live a righteous life. 
pray and pray through before you go. That temptation should not keep on overcoming you. That he was in should not uh, keep on overcoming you. You should overcome. You should overcome. You'll be more than a conqueror. Temptation will come. You say, I will stand. And those the trials will come. I will stand. No, you will not do evil. You will not continue in, in evil. You'll say, Lord, cleanse me, wash me, purge me, purify me, make me holy, make me righteous. He will do it. He will do it. Salvation is so precious and salvation is so great that that salvation will keep you away from sin. And then you keep on studying the word of God so that you live the righteous life. The word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Awake to righteousness and sin not.